Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to begin reading the very first verse. Hebrews chapter 12, in the first verse, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such affliction of, the, of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not resisted in the blood, striving against sin. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your holy word. God, we pray this morning that you would meet with us, Lord, that we would set our worldly sides of thought uh, aside, Lord, and that we would uh, be centered in on your word, Lord, and that you would come down and that you would meet with us because we understand and know, Lord, that if that doesn't occur, that all is vain. We pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, I believe the writer to be Paul, and I believe he was writing to the church at uh, Jerusalem, and I believe one of the reasons he did not uh, take credit for the letter is because of Peter. Uh, they had had several contentions before, and he probably didn't want to add insult to injury, so to speak, and so he just sent the letter. Another thing that you might consider when you think of Hebrews, uh, the church at Jerusalem being the very first church ever, he may have had a degree of respect that he didn't want to be guilty of criticizing them too much. But again, that's just my thoughts. We do not have a historical writer uh, for Hebrews, but again, just the style of literature, I think it to be Paul. Now, he begins this 12th chapter with referring back to the 11th chapter. Now, the 11th chapter is the chapter of faith. It goes down a lot of the historic men uh, uh, prior to the, even the law uh, and bringing it down to modern day that, that faith impacted their life. Now, if you have faith in Christ, you say that you're a saved individual, and your faith hasn't impacted your life, uh, make your calling and election sure, because it always will. And we're going to look at, uh, very quickly at some of the less known ones in, uh, Hebrew, in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, starting in verse thir 31, just so we'll get an idea that faith can impact anyone. The great patriarchs, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we all understand their role, but at the end of the great hall of faith, he mentions some lesser known people. And he begins in verse 31, and what more shall I say? For the time shall fail, uh, 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 I'm sorry, I want to do 50, uh, 31 too, by faith, the harlot Rahab. For the time would uh, perish not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Now, if you know the story of Rahab, Rahab was a harlot or a hooker or a prostitute. And when the spies came to spy out the city of Jericho, she let them into her house. She hid them in their house. And uh, they said, because of this service, if you'll just put a red strip in your window, you shall be spared. And you know what? She did it. In fact, the Bible says she did it right away, that she didn't, that she didn't wait, that she moved very quickly and did what she was instructed and tied that strip in there. See, faith will push you to works. And faith that doesn't push you to works isn't really even, even the time to think, to think about it. If faith doesn't move you to works, 
person, your faith is empty, it's dead, is how the Bible describes it. So we find uh, Rahab, uh, this sinner, this harlot, moved to good works to the preserving of her house. Now, I'll say one more thing about Rahab and we'll move on. Remember, she went and begged people to come into her house. That is a move of faith. That, that is a move toward the works of God. Uh, verse 32, and what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon. Now, we all remember Gideon, and you know what? Our faith must grow through time. And experience will grow your faith. If you're not willing to step out and do something for the cause of Christ and gain experience, your faith will, uh, will remain like it always has been. Remember what Paul said to the church at Corinth? He said, you're babes in the faith. He said, when you should be on meat, you're still on formula or milk. And so he, uh, uh, he views that as an anticipation. Now, how did Gideon start out? He was, he was low on the totem pole, wasn't he? Right. he did he, and the Lord God gave him some instruction, and he says, I'm not sure if this is going to work. And he says, make there come a dew around, uh, uh, around the, uh, the fleece, and I'll believe you. And the Bible says that he rained water out of it. That's how much dew that he saw. And he says, well, I'm not, still sure, I'm not still sure about it. Make the grass have to do and make the fleece dry. And he did that as well. But you know, if you read, and I think we preached on that very recently, whenever it came down to men laughing like dogs, he didn't question God no more. Right. Now, if you ever, uh, we, we reviewed that the last Sunday. We preached on that. Have you ever seen, have you ever seen a man laugh like a dog? I haven't. And you know what? I would, be, I would be prone to question that if God said you use only the ones that laugh like a dog. Right. And, and so we see that Gideon's faith moved him to works as well. And, and if your faith doesn't do that, you know, uh, there's a lot of different churches out there that say, well, you got to work. I don't believe that, but I tell you what, grace will, grace will result in works. And if it doesn't, uh, uh, you may have a real problem. And so he refers to Gideon as well. Then he says, and Barak. Uh, and of Samson. Now, I think it's very interesting that Samson is mentioned here in the great hall of faith. Because Samson was a rebel. Samson did not follow God all that much. Faith, uh, he was not, he would not be somebody you'd want your boy to aspire to be. Uh, and, and that wasn't Samson. But I want you to see that he did believe God. Remember what, what was the last thing we find Samson doing? Praying. He said, God, give me strength just one more time to bring the temple down. And you know what? He believed God could do it. Yeah. Now, God did it. <laughs> and, and give him that strength. He, Samson died in the process. But I want you to see what it was. It wasn't the life that Samson had lived. It was his belief in God. And, and you know, a lot of times, and, and if you follow that temple, the temple was an ungodly place where God's people uh, would be killed and made fun of. They did Samson the same way in the same place. And, and uh, just a horrible place to be. And God brought it down through what? God's man. See, you know, we often get on this, uh, this kick, you know, with God's sovereignty. And God is definitely sovereign. But listen, that don't exclude us from doing something. And, 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 and so why did the temple uh, uh, of the false God come down? Faith and someone doing something. That, that's how it came down. And so we see, we see this man that had a very mixed life, that he had faith noteworthy enough to be in this hall of faith. 
and of Japheth, and of David. Now, Jep uh, Jep Jephthah or Jephthah, uh, another one you don't think about more, and I had to research this one. That was that was Noah's son. It was the last one, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And yeah. uh, you, you, and you think, well, what did Japheth do? Well, I mean, he did a lot. If you think about it, he helped build a boat. He got on the boat, <laughs> and. Remember after the ark landed in the years pre uh, after that happened, his father Noah got drunk, and remember him uh, and uh, Shem went this way and threw a blanket over him. Now, have you ever thought that that would be a very complicated thing to do? Now, being a nurse literally all my life, and sometimes uh, in some kind of healthcare, I've covered a lot of people up. But you know what? It always takes me looking at them. Um, now, I have thrown a quilt over Joey like this and just threw it up in the air and it landed on him real nice. But I was looking at him. Have you ever tried to throw a quilt behind you and anticipate it to land in the right place? You know what? That takes faith, does it not? Now, it may simplistic, be simplistic faith, but apparently it was noteworthy. And, and so we see then, what we need is this childlike faith with the anticipation of results. And, that, and, and so Paul reviews all of them. Now back to verse 12, he says, Looking at that, wherefore seeing, remembering all these great men of faith that, ever, that did everything from receiving the law of God to the minute task of throwing a quilt over his dad, reviewing all of those men of faith, we are compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us, wait, let us lay aside every weight. Now he'll say every weight in sin. And I've seen preachers combine the two, but that's not what it says. It says weight and sin. You ever thought what your weight is? Gentlemen, we hit it every day, do we not? Oh, we better be. Before I was a nurse, I was an EMT, and before I was an EMT, I was a, a nurse's aide. That has been my lot in life. And if things go as planned tomorrow, I'll get up and head to the nursing home yet again. Now, while I'm very thankful to have a way to feed my children, it is a way. It, 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 you know what? I, and I've never been able to fathom this because in my preaching ministry, it's never even been a remote possibility. But just coming here, just opening my Bible, just knocking on a few doors up and down the streets of Dover, it, it is a way. Now, again, I, I'm not fussing about it, but it is something, if I would be very honest, it is something that gets in the way. Right? And so here we find the writer saying, you set aside that weight. And then he says, you set aside, because you when, when you have a comma right there, and, and, and the previous also applies, lay aside every weight and lay aside every sin. We have to lay aside both. If we want to be successful in our walk with Christ, we have to lay that stuff aside. It's, it's very difficult. And, and Brother Eric and I was talking, uh, I guess it was Friday evening, and, and, and we was working on this old headstone, and we were both enjoying it, but Eric brought up the the very much the reality, the futility of that. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and so we see, that's what Paul was writing about, is we need to prioritize, we need to lay aside things that interfere with sharing the gospel. And then he says, and let us run with patience, the race that is set before us. 
Now we see two things, one that we all lack of, patience, and the other one, the race that's already set. Now, if you run professionally, which I have never done and probably never will be, but I did run uh, well enough one time in my freshman year of high school, I'd be everyone else around the football field. I've done a little thing about it. I don't know what, I guess mother had it. And, uh, I, and, and you run with patience. And that's what he's saying. Uh, it's set. Look for the markers. Now, our markers was this, was two times around the football field, and that equaled a mile. And it was set. Coach Wallace said this. And you know what? There wasn't a one of us that ran back toward the school building because we knew what set. It was set. Going back to the school building would do us no good because it wasn't on the set course. Now, with us knowing that we have a set course, how easy is it to follow it? And we make it complicated and, and add all these and, ifs, and buts in it. And the Bible says right here, it's set before us. It, it is already laid out. Just set that mess aside and follow the course that I have set for you. And then he says in verse 2, looking while we're running. Now, if you're running, I like to look ahead and see where I'm going because you can trip very easy. But notice what this says. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now that is twofold. Number one, if you want to be successful in running this race, keep your eyes on Jesus. Now, the second thing with that, you know what? I didn't have this problem back in, this would have been 84, y'all. Uh, there wasn't no snakes on the football field that day. But it was in May and it could have been. Right? Now if I saw a big Radbird as big as my arm out on that football field, it would slowed me down, right? You know what? There's going to be rattlesnakes along the way. I wish I could be like Joel Olstein and, and tell you all you're going to find is dollar bills. But that's simply not the truth. There's going to be rattlers. There's going to be holes. There's, there, and you know what? Most people don't get into this. But maybe there will be dollar bills. And the thing is, you don't need them. <clears throat> now, if I, if I saw a hundred dollar bill, I'm stopping, right? Yeah. You know, I don't know if this is true. Uh, you know, you know how truthful Facebook can be. But I saw this on Facebook the other day. New thing out. I, I have no idea whether it's true or not. That people are putting hundred dollar bills in cars, like on their on the uh, windshield wiper, and they're filled with meth. And uh, like I said, I have no idea. But man, that hundred dollar bill would have made me stop. But you know what, if that's true, one dose of meth, and you literally can be addicted the rest of your life. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And, and so there's gonna be obscurity in the way, there's gonna be things to slow us down, there's gonna be difficulty along the way, and, and so what we need to do is keep our eyes on the prize. Then he says, who for the joy, referring back to Christ's rice, uh, who for the joy that was uh, set before him endured the cross. That was a race. That, that, that was a child in, in Jesus' life. And the Bible says at any time he could call ten legions of angels to his assistance. But you know what? He kept his eyes on the prize. He kept focused. And you know what? Because he did, we have a chance to be with him for everlasting more because he kept to the course. And if he hadn't, there would be no hope. There would, there would be nothing that we would have to look forward to if he had not kept his eyes on the prize. 
Then it says, and he sat down. After it was done, after it was complete, and when our race is run, we will do the we, we won't sit by the right hand of God, but we'll sit at his feet. And it says, and he sat down at the right hand of God. Why? The race was done. When do you sit down? After it's you know what? We want our rest now, don't we? But our rest, this is not our time for rest. This, we are in the race right now. As I speak, we are in the race. Rest time has not come yet. And, and so we see after the Lord Jesus finished his race, then he sat down. Verse 3, for consider him that endureth such contradiction of sinners against himself. Now what's that saying? It is saying you consider Christ. And how contrary that was to his nature. The man that walked on water. The, the man that said, peace be still. The man that gave sight back to the blind. Was unmercifully beaten. Bled to death. Nailed to a cross. That's a contradiction for the mighty God of heaven, is it not? It's a contradiction. And you know what? Sometimes you're going to live in contradiction. You know what? Despite what all the world thinks this morning, despite about all the other uh, people in Stewart County that's offended by grace, we're still right. But do you see people getting excited about it? Man, New Testament, y'all keep going. We're in, we're, we're in that situation. We're being uh, challenged. And so what did Christ do? Well, he just submitted to it. And you know what we need to do? We need to continue preaching the true gospel. And we need to continue along the way just like Christ did. And so when Christ was finished, he sat down on the right hand of God. And the very same way, he, he served in a time where everything was against him. Then he says, lest we be wearied and faint in your minds. Now, have you ever fainted? There's always, there's always a reason you faint. Now, I don't know that I've actually ever fainted. Uh, one time I thought maybe, but it may be because it's just so hot. But my mother fainted one time. And she was living in Nashville, and she was working in the factory. She said it was August, just a hot August. And the Red Cross came by and tried to talk all the factory workers into donating blood. And she said, I was standing there, and they just kept talking about blood and how it ran out and how red it was and what a benefit it was. And she said, the next thing I knew, Hazel was over me going, June, June. Uh, you know why? Because it was a contradiction. It, it, it was a difficulty. It, it, it was a hardship. And so she fainted. And you know what? You can faint too, spiritually. The one time I think maybe I fainted, we lived in a house when I was growing up. And, you know, we had a place upstairs. I wouldn't exactly call it a room, uh, but we stored stuff up there, more of an attic. And it had... It, it, some of us older ones will remember this. The room was never finished. In other words, the you could see the rafters and the lave and the and the tin from up, from when you came up the steps. And I don't remember what uh, I went up there for, but I went up there and about an August day, about what Mother described when she fainted, and. Uh, I got up there, and it was, man, it was the hottest I'd ever been, and I grabbed what I needed, and it was going down, and my nose started to bleed. And uh, I got out of there, and then I felt real woozy, and I sat down, and Judy uh, said I think, but now Judy could embellish things. And, uh, uh, but anyway, there was a contradiction, you know. My health was being... Uh, my health was being challenged. Have you ever fainted spiritually? Absolutely. Boy, I have. And every time I did faint spiritually, it was always because of a challenge. 
Now, this is the thing. We know what challenges for fainting in the flesh is. And if we're reasonable, they're actually pretty easy to avoid, right? But see, fainting spiritually, it's going to look good to the flesh. You know what? That was in 81, <laughs> uh, 40 plus years ago now. I have went back up in an attic that didn't have no insulation in it and walls since. I learned from the experience, right? Spiritual challenges are not going to be that way. They'll be enticing to the flesh. They'll be like a cool uh, air-conditioned room on a hot August evening. They're going to, they're going to look like uh, fried chicken after a long sermon on a Sunday day, right? And there is where we have to be discerning Christians. Is that really a benefit to me? Is that really going to help me any way spiritually? And then we can make our summation at, uh, like that, and we find that, that the writer reminds the Jerusalem church about these contradictions. Verse 4. Do you ever resist that, Brother Junior? Uh, strong enough to admit it, said, yeah, I've been there. Did you resist it? I think that's our only way when we're in that threatened situation when Satan has come against us is to resist. Now, what had crept back in to two things we know for sure crept back into the church of Jerusalem. Number one was works. And number two, the self-righteous Jews didn't want to be around the Gentile believers anymore. Right? He said, resist it. You ain't resisted to death. They're not under, uh, one person under the sound of my voice that is resisted to death. In fact, uh, the first one that is mentioned beside the loving Lord Jesus Christ is Stephen. That's a man that resisted to death. He said, I'm not going to agree with you. You, you stiff-necked and unbelievers in heart. I'm not going to admit to that. He gave his life for it. But he tells the church of Jerusalem, you've not resisted to death. So how do you resist the opposition of the devil? And the devil will oppose you. He will come your way. He will put situations that look good in front of you how are you going to resist it? Do you not need a plan? Yeah. How did the Lord Jesus Christ resist the first time? He quoted scripture. Man should not live by bread alone. And I think it's in Matthew's description of that, but it may be Luke's. The Bible says this, and he left him a little while. No, he left him for a season. You know what that says to me? It means it came back. <laughs> right. Yeah, right? And, and, and so we're going to see the same thing. So what's your plan? What are you going to do uh, when the next $100 bill falls from the sky? Are you going to pick it up? Or are you going to think about it? You've not resisted unto death. You, you, you've not done anything remarkable for the cause of Christ. You've not... You've not Wore yourself out resisting. Now go with me to 1 Peter. And just a little bit over. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, the pastor there at Jerusalem. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 beginning in verse 5. Likewise, you younger. Now I'm very encouraged to have quite a bit of young people here. And for a church our size, that's remarkable. But uh, there's Jared and, and Adam, and I'm like, we got some young people. But remember this, they're in their 30s now. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and so we see that huh, when that's your younger, you may you may consider, I'm just, uh, I, I'm just very glad that Madison and Justin are here because they're, see, they're younger still. And, and that's the livelihood of church. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, 
all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. In other words, I'm subject to Sarah and Adam is subject to me and uh, Brother Junior is subject uh, uh, to Brother Jody and you know, everybody's like going, woo, 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 man. But what, when, what is it when, I, when you have to say, Jared, I've seen some things that concern me. That's a whole different thing, ain't it? Putting it into action is quite the flip side, is it not? Because you know what? And I believe it's true here at New Testament. We love each other as family. And some of the most difficult thing, things with your family is telling them the truth. I remember when Judy was sick, and I looked at Mother, and I said, Mama, she's not going to make it. Can you imagine saying that to someone about one of your, somebody saying that to you uh, about Bella or Sarah or Adam? Saying, Larry, it's not going to happen. But you know what? And by the way, Mama didn't believe me. But it was good that she heard it. You see what I'm saying? As bitter your own child dying, as bitter as that news was, it's good that she heard it from somebody. And, and, and so we find then that the things that we often get that are beneficial, we don't necessarily like. Necessarily like. Verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you in due term. So listen to your church members and humble yourself to God. Even when the direction is not pleasant, even when the direction is not something you want to do, humble yourselves to what he wants. Verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Now, we, we, we run by that sometimes, and, and we don't really think about it. Uh, Donna primarily takes care of our chickens. And she cares for them. That's what that means. She takes some feed. She takes some fresh water. She cleans their house. That's caring for somebody. It involves action. The Lord God does that for us. Now, do we see it? And, and uh, you think our chickens go, Donna, thank you so much. This is the best cold water we've ever had. They don't, their brain is about the size of the end of my thumb. They never even acknowledge it. <laughs> Sometimes we're like a bunch of chickens anyway. <laughs> we don't even acknowledge it. We, we, we don't even see it for what it is. And, and, and so we find that we as the Lord's people, it is very edifying to the Lord to, to recognize these things and go beyond that and serve them because of them. Humble yourselves, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, and vigilant is attention to detail, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith. Now, in verse 8, we have a very clear description of Satan. Number one, the Bible says he is our adversary. Uh, <laughs> because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion. Now, uh, I've not been to the zoo that many times, and I've definitely never seen a wild lion. Hope I never do. But, you know, it would have to be that just that roar would be paralyzing. I don't think he'd even have to run to catch me. You see what I'm saying? That's what the devil does to you. He makes an he, he wants to present you with a situation that is beyond possibility to handle. That's his roar. Yeah. But you know what? The Bible says our God can do all things. 
So when he presents this impossible situation, you remind him God is in control, not him. Resist the devil. When the devil comes by you and says you're a failure at what you do, you resist the devil. Now you may be flat on your back, you may be beat, but you remind him I am saved by grace and I am as good in the glory as I'm already there. Resist him. We need to review. You ever wonder why the Lord's churches are defeated in 2023? I will submit to you it's because we do not resist the devil. We take what he says as, as how it is. I've never known that to be true. The Bible says he's a liar. Right? Do you think it's because he can quote scripture? He's telling you the truth. If you believe that, you may hook up with Joe Olstein, right? Do you resist the devil? And if you do, what does it take? I believe we live in a day where truly the ignorance is so much in the Lord's churches and even in what you loosely would call Christianity that we don't know how to resist Him anymore. First of all, you better know the Word of God because we know for sure that's how Christ in the flesh began His resistance against Satan. And if we don't know the Bible, we got a real problem. Now, you know, the Bible says this concerning his word, hide, the, hide his words in thy heart that they might not sin against God. Now, I don't know if you remember it, but a couple, uh, I guess it may have been last week, week before, Jared asked me a scripture. And I'm not, I don't have the memory I used to, but I me immediately began quoting. And you know why? Because it was hidden in my heart as a young man. So I was prepared. And when Satan comes against you and says, this is an impossibility, that's when you answer him, all things are possible through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You answer him with scripture. And he will come that way. That's why sometimes we don't realize it. We have to snuggle down to our Bibles and get away from it all. What you're really doing is opposing Satan. And that is, that is a wonderful thing. Who resist steadfast in the faith? Now, if you underline in your Bible that last portion that says steadfast in the faith. Now, that's not just faith like the confidence we have in Christ, not to belittle that. Faith is the essence of things that we believe. But the faith... It's the oracles and truth handed down to God uh, by his men through, through the centuries. The faith, the faith, uh, the doctrine of Christ alone, the doctrine of his knowledge in all things, predestinating things to the end of time. Uh, uh, the faith that there is one church and one kind of church alone. That is the faith. He says, you resist him with that. Now, how can we do that if you don't even know what you believe? You know what I found among many people? If they are Baptists, they go there because mother and daddy did. That's not the faith. And that's the kind that Satan looks for that don't even know, really know what they believe. And if they know what they, don't, what they believe, they don't know why they believe it. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in the brethren that are in the world. The next thing he reminds us the way to resist. Hey, you ain't the first one going through it, and you won't be the last. Right? You ever had a pity party? Poor Larry. He's done so much for Christ and now it seems like the whole world's against him. Well, you know what? I haven't been thrown on the Isle of Patmos yet. You talk about being alone. John was alone, wasn't he? You see what I'm saying? He says, you think about other people. There are other people going through much, much worse than we are. And that should give us great encouragement 
in, in, in our resistance against Satan. I've read of people dying for the faith. Are you resisting? Uh, do, you, do you have that much confidence in the person of Christ? Listen, when you're about ready to throw up your hands and quit, think about Gordon Downs, 82 years old, dying with Alzheimer's on the mission field still. You ain't resisted to death, right? So we can find a great cloud of witnesses that, that, that are glorious and helpful in this resistance. Don't focus on what Satan is presenting to you. One last place in the book of James. James chapter 4. We'll begin in reading verse 5. James 4 and verse 5. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit dwelleth in us, lusteth to, to envy? Now, uh, notice that is lowercase s. It is not the Holy Spirit of God. It's that, that nature that we possess, that that spirit that sometimes can be found when we say things before we think them out, when we, uh, when we snap at people when we should have been praying for them. He, that, that, see, that spirit is still just as depraved as this filthy, stinking flesh you're looking at. And, and, and sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we're, we don't say, okay, I've got to remember that I still have a personality. And Don told me this one time, and it's very true, and I know it from other people that's had head, head injuries or, or brain surgery. She said, Larry, your personality has changed since that surgery. And you know, one thing I could say is that I agree with her. I have a very short fuse now, and that, that's not a good quality, and I used to not be like that. You see what I'm saying? That's the spirit. I'm not talking about the eternal soul. I'm talking about how I present. I'm talking about the kindness or lack of kindness that I show to others. That kind of spirit. And, and, and so Paul, uh, excuse me, James kind of reminds them, do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. In other words, we want envy. We are jealous. We, we do want things all our way. That, that, that's the nature of, uh, of the personality of man. Verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Now, what we love to say is, well, that's just how I am. But the Bible says you can be successful. But God gives, in other words, if our personality is not very friendly, he gives us more grace. We can overcome that. We, we can be a different person in the name of Christ. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisted the proud, but giveth grace unto who? The humble. Now, if we want to have a good testimony in and among others, we got to put God first. If, 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 we, if we say, you know what, I'm just not going to act this way, and we're humble, the Bible just said that he would give us grace to do it. And so we can't blame things on other people. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Now, we see the last thing we can do. First of all, the writer, James, puts in, hey, watch your personality. Watch your attitude. Watch, watch how you present. And he says, you resist that. You resist Satan. You know, uh, and I know Satan is a very powerful being. But... Why would, why would God inspire a man to write to resist if it wasn't possible? Now, we saw in Hebrews, 
we saw in James, and we saw in Peter that we are to resist, right? So we need to resist the devil. When those inclinations come to your mind, and you know they're not of God, stop them. Begin singing, oh, how I love Jesus. Do something, right? Begin to quote scripture, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There's lots of things we can do. Re resist it. You can. You need some equipment, but you can. You ever thought how merciful and good the Lord God has been to us as a people just with the, the complete word of God at our disposal? Open it up, click, however you want to get to it. Resist it. You know, one of the chief tools we have to resist is literally at our fingertips in 2023. Use it. Use your brethren. Use your sisters. Say, hey, I am really boggled down with this. Would you pray for me? Mm -hmm. And you know what? The Lord can, <laughs> excuse me, the devil can use anything to boggle you down because he knows you. Mm -hmm. he, he, he knows. And you know what? It's just, it's just like I read it, said, what, what the Word of God says here. He knows he can't take your soul to hell if you're saved. But he can sure resist resist you. Right. He's a master at it. Amen. And so what we need to do is learn to fight back. Satan, you're not going to do this to me. Now we can't be foolish. Uh, one time, a long time ago, I was working for Home Health, and Mother, when she was still living, she's always trying to get us to come to her church. And uh, so they were having a scene. And Don and the kids and my brother and his wife went down there because I had to work. And uh, something went wrong with the sound system. And that woman was trying to sing, said, open that door, open that door and let Satan out. Well, they did and the sound system didn't be back up. See, that's foolishness, right? But we can resist him with faith. We can, we can resist him knowing the word of God. The question is, have you resisted him today? 